Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. As I was uh, going for my walk uh, this morning, I uh, passed by some high voltage power lines. Now, these um, power lines are ultra high voltage, so I think they're well over 100,000 volts. And when I think about it, these, these cables that run from the power station um, provide the energy to run thousands of homes, perhaps ten thousands, several ten thousands of, of homes through these wires. And when you think about this, these, these wires up there, these metal wires, um, I'm not sure what metal they're made out of, whether it's copper or, or aluminium, uh, but some uh, good conductor uh, like that. So it's amazing that through those those wires on those poles, this one set of poles, it's going to power all the air conditioners, all the stoves, the lighting, the heaters, the refrigerators, all these electric motors and heating devices, welders and so forth that are being used in the local industry are all provided by the energy that's, that's travelling uh, along these wires, the electrical energy. And it, when I, I think about it, it's quite an interesting concept that we um, provide what we call a, a voltage or a, a potential difference. Now, what is a, a potential uh, a potential difference? Well, we know that um, if we have a um, if you have an object uh, sitting on a table, say for example a, a ball sitting on the table and you uh, push the ball and it comes to the edge of the table so that the table isn't supporting it anymore, it falls to the floor. And we say that it has potential energy and that is because it's in this gravitational field and it is being uh, pulled by the gravitational energy to the, to the lower um, state of energy that is closer to the gravitational centre. And, of course, the same, the same goes with, uh, with heat. If we have something that is hot, um, the, if we have a heat up a, a bar of iron with a, an oxy torch so that it's glowing red and we put that uh, glowing piece of metal into some water, the water will immediately begin to boil around the, the metal and the water will, will heat up. In other words, the, the, uh, the uh, metal rod that was red uh, will quickly lose its colour and, and cool down. And so the energy, that heat energy, when that rod is heated up to you know, eight, 900 degrees centigrade, uh, flows into the cool of water and heats the water. So always the energy flows from the, uh, from the hotter or the higher thermal potential to the lower, uh, from the higher gravitational potential to the lower state. Um, and the same thing when we talk about electrical voltages. So um, we have an, uh, an electric field um, and we... Um, we can apply, um, and the generators in the power station generate a, a very high voltage. So they generate, by putting in a lot of energy from the steam turbines, um, they generate a very high electrical voltage. Um, and then that allows for, it's believed, electrons to flow in the, um, in the conductor that provides what we call electrical current because... It's actually the amount of current or amount of number of electrons that flowing through something that actually generates the the power. So you can have a, a very high voltage but no current and it, it won't move anything. Uh, it won't heat anything. Uh, so you need you need both and that constitutes the the energy. And what fascinates me is that at the speed of light, uh, which is you know virtually, you know, it's very fast, virtually instantaneous in terms of everyday living. Um, 
the the voltage flows along these wires at the other end. So we can apply we can apply a potential to this wire, this high voltage wire, and a thousand miles by a thousand kilometers away, instantaneously, as far as we can measure, there are changes that occur. And so somehow this energy is available immediately, virtually immediately, at the other end. Now, this whole concept of electrical potential, electric fields, magnetic fields, we can't um, easily detect uh, magnetic fields, usually. Um, uh, Maybe some people are sensitive to fluctuating magnetic fields, have some sort of sensitivity and can uh, detect them. Sometimes we can detect electric fields, um, but I, I suspect it's more that we're getting a reaction to on our skin to, uh, you know, and our hairs are standing up or, or something like that. But it's interesting, these, these, these fields, they're there, you can move your hand through them, this sort of thing, just like you can move your hand through the uh, gravitational field and we, we can't, um, can't detect them. And it it just amazed me this whole concept of um, electric fields and and electricity and 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 how it works. Um, it it's quite amazing that um, metals like copper, silver, aluminium are good conductors of this electricity. Whereas if we make the um, the material out of you know something else like um, limestone or sulfur or uh, you know other other non-metallic elements um, with the exception of graphite of course graphite um, which is a form of carbon can be a conductor but it's interesting that some compounds are conductors and some um, and some elements are conductors and some elements are non-conductors and generally we have the the me- what we call the metallic elements are conductors of electricity, but the non-metallic elements aren't. So why why is it that the non-metallic um, materials don't conduct electricity very easily? Uh, and why is it that we can make you know insulators out of these materials? And it's it's quite fascinating that um, it's all to do with the the structure around the atom. The array, away the electrons are, are arranged, and I can remember when I was studying physics at university, I was in the last classes that were taught valve theory. So we had what we call radio valves, and so valves were used as rectifiers and so forth um, in uh, you know in radio sets and in pieces of equipment and and so forth, radar sets, all these sort of things. And the changeover was to semiconductor theory. Uh, which, of course, was uh, transistors. And, of course, now semiconductor theory has taken over and we have all these little, uh, you know, mini computers. But, again, it was quite fascinating learning the semiconductor theory and the um, and the sort of forbidden zones in the electron structure and how electrons could pass under certain conditions and, and so forth. And we had these semiconductor arrangements that would array, uh, allow for electrical flow in one direction only. Um, and thus we could make rectifier systems and, and so forth. And it was, um, you know, it was quite fascinating. One of the projects that uh, I was working on in the research laboratories where uh, I was employed at the at the time we were measuring we wanted to measure the measure the partial pressure of oxygen in molten steel uh, because at the time steel making was was largely guesswork uh, the operators would see the um, the ladle of pig iron that came from the blast furnace being um, poured into the basic oxygen uh, furnace. Um, where oxygen was uh, then blown through the pig iron to burn out the remaining carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, these other non-metallic impurities that would affect the strength and the characteristics of the resultant steel uh, that we uh, were producing. And this was the, the BOS, basic oxygen system, was a new invention. Uh, it was actually developed, co-developed in Australia, actually, um, 
over and above the open hearth system, which was the old-fashioned way of making steel, which was a much slower process. But the operators just used to look and see how much, uh, how many sparks were coming off the steel as it was being poured because the amount of sparks coming off gave a sort of a bit of a visual indication of the amount of carbon and so forth that was mixed in still with the steel. And um, it was all done by experience and, and guesswork. So we were looking to develop a, a system where we could measure um, the partial pressure of oxygen, how much oxygen was still was in the steel um, during the process of blowing it with the um, with the oxygen lance. Uh, and of course, the steel at this temperature is just below two thousand degrees. Uh, so a very hostile environment, very few things survive in there. You have to have metals such as platinum and so forth. But we were looking at, uh, again, uh, semiconductor-type material, uh, yttrium doped uh, zirconia at the time, because, again, the fact that there was a difference in oxygen level between that in the between the level in the steel and the level at a reference material, a, a chromium oxide material placed at the other end of the semiconductor, generated a small voltage. And so using that voltage measurement, we could actually measure the oxygen level in the steel, very low levels, of course, um, in the steel under those molten conditions. But there was another factor that was involved, and that was the fact that we were using these uh, yttrium-doped uh, zirconia uh, semiconductor-type materials, and so they are a conductor-type uh, material, and again, they would uh, develop their, old vol their own voltage across the temperature gradient. So you had your, your molten steel um, in their 1700, 1800 uh, centigrade, um, out to the outside of the probe, which was at a much lower temperature, maybe only a few hundred degrees, you also produced another electrical voltage just due to the difference in temperature. And that was the CBEC coefficient for that mineral. And one of the jobs that I had was actually measuring the uh, CBEC coefficient of uh, yttrium dope zirconia with different uh, ratios because uh, this work had never been published before. And uh, so it was quite fascinating, all these fields that are related. But what, what struck me is that through these laws of physics that are based on the structure of the atoms, we have these amazing properties of all the different metals. Um, another metal that I was involved in researching later on was titanium. And this is, uh, uh, titanium is an amazing metal. It's one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust, but very difficult to uh, refine and produce titanium from its ore, from its oxide or its uh, iron oxide ore that it occurs in. But titanium, of course, is lighter than steel, very strong and very resistant to corrosion. So it's a very good uh, metal, but it seems that God has limited the amount of uh, titanium that we can get access to. It's not that easy to uh, produce compared to other metals like aluminium and, and iron and copper and uh, so forth. But as I thought about this, the, 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 this whole structure of uh, the way these elements formed. And, and, you know, when you we look at cosmology and that, they talk about helium and, and the synthesis of different elements up to carbon and so forth. But when we look at the, the higher elements here, we're getting into some very interesting ones in the everyday materials that we use. And how did the structure of these atoms come about? Did they evolve somehow, non-directed, to have all these amazing systematic properties? Um, it's interesting that James Clark Maxwell, uh, one of the, law, the guy that um, discovered that light was a combination of electromagnetic fields, and um, was one of you know perhaps the greatest phys one of the greatest physicists of all time, said, you know, if people want to believe in evolution. You know, how did atoms evolve? And, of course, one of the other aspects we, we talk about um, is, uh, you know, the Big Bang Theory and that, um, you know, everything, you know, uh, started and exploded. Well, hang on, how, how did that all, all generate? Where did, it, where did it come from and where did the laws come from that, that governed that? 
To me, this just powerfully points to a a, a creator. Um, and it amazes me that we can apply these voltages, this potential we can generate, and this potential will drive this current through what we call an electrical current, which we understand is a movement of electrons, through these conductors that can turn powerful electric motors, can, um, you know, heat things, um, and um, it's just such a, a useful ent- entity. Um, the amazing properties, they all work together, to me just point to an amazing creator. But the other thing is our our minds have been able to understand and make these great discoveries. And one of the things that has really impressed me is that, you know, since the time of Francis Bacon and so forth, where you have the formation of the Royal Society in the UK and the the really development of science that spun from that environment there, it was essentially in a very Christian-based um, environment where people believed in a creator God. They believed that there was a supernatural God that had created the world, that had created everything. Uh, and was behind everything. And that was the culture in which science developed. And when I look at a number of the greatest scientists that made the really great, stunning breakthroughs, so many of them were really strong Christians. And the same in mathematics as well. And um, if you go to creationministries.com, um, have a look through their book lists there or Answers in Genesis. They have books on, you know, signed, uh, great scientists that were creationists. And so many of these scientists were scientists that laid the, you know, fundamental laws like Faraday and Maxwell, these sort of people, um, were, were great uh, Christians. And it's interesting that science, this understanding of nature, did not develop in the cultures where people worshipped idols or worshipped you know, nature itself. It's, um, I, I, I find that very interesting. And I, I think that God has gradually revealed um, an understanding uh, to us. But what, one of the things that fascinates me is that our minds, our human minds, have the capability to understand these complex systems. And, of course, as we you know, delve into biochemistry, of course, we learn that the, the systems are just so enormously complex. And we have teams and teams of scientists working together. Um, and gradually we've been understanding these things. But again, getting back to physics, though, I think one of the fundamental laws of, of physics and theories is, the, is this whole idea of, of thermodynamics and... Um, it's it's interesting. There was a um, a quote uh, of Einstein that was published in Science in the journal Science back in 1967 um, on uh, volume uh, 159, uh, 157, sorry, 157, page 509, and it was um, um, an article thermodynamics in Einstein's universe, and the author quotes Einstein as saying. That um, it is only f- uh, that thermodynamics is the only physical theory of universal content, which, within the framework of the applicability of its basic concepts, I'm convinced will never be overthrown. And this whole idea of uh, thermodynamics, and particularly the second law of thermodynamics, is that everything tends to a state of greatest disorder or everything tends to the state of higher entropy. So entropy is a a state of disorder. And so we go from order to disorder. And I mean, we see that, don't we, in our, just in our living spaces, in our homes, (laughs) Um, uh, particularly in a child's bedroom, you put everything in its place, all the toys are put away and before long the child comes, plays with the toys and it's left out because it takes work, energy to put it back into order. And um, 
In this, uh, in the book that I've often referred to just recently, Design and Catastrophe, 51 Scientists Explore Evidence in Nature, that's uh, published by um, Andrews University Press, there's a, a, um, an article in there by a, um, a chemistry professor, Dr. Mitch Mensmer. Uh, it's called um, A God of Law, Order and Beauty. And um, he points out some interesting things about uh, thermodynamics. And he points out that within thermodynamics, there are three different types of bound or three types of boundaries between a system and its surroundings. You can have a uh, isolating, uh, closed, and open. And an isolating boundary permits no exchange of energy and matter. Um, and um, and it defines essentially the first law of thermodynamics, and that is that the total energy within an isolated system is constant. Um, energy and matter cannot be created. To, well, you can convert energy into matter and vice versa, but the total energy of that system stored in that system either as energy and matter remains constant once it's um, isolated. And so a closed boundary, a closed uh, system as opposed to an isolated system, permits an exchange of energy with its surroundings but not matter. And in an open boundary system there's an exchange of both energy and matter with its surrounding. And so um, this uh, Dr Mensmer uh, looks at if we look at a flower as a living system that exhibits beauty um, it, we can see it's an open boundary system because it requires both energy from the sun and matter in the form of water, carbon dioxide and nutrients from the soil. And so um, in addition, however, to this first law of thermodynamics, we've got the second law of thermodynamics. And this is the law about entropy. And it's essentially a law that says that particularly for living systems, entropy in increases. Um, and um, so, uh, and that is it tends to a, a state of greater disorder or, or uh, another way of putting it is that everything tends to a state of equilibrium where things are, are balanced. Um, and so a system with high energy a high entropy, rather, be one where the energy is widely dispersed at various energy levels and locations, um, and uh, well, the arrangement of the system is highly non-specific. But of course, when we look at um, the uh, uh, this particular law of thermodynamics, it, it has a predictable nature. In other words, uh, we use it to predict what happens. In other words. If we place a hot object in a cool environment, the hot object will cool down. We won't find that the cooler, cool environment will get even cooler and transfer some of its energy to the hot system and make it hotter. It doesn't happen that way. In other words, if we have an iron bar sitting there, suddenly one end won't become cold and the other end become hot. Um, in other words, we can't drive it that way to produce that higher temperature. The temperature always will run from a hot temperature to a cooler temperature. Um, just like if you want the ball that you dropped off the table to go back up onto the table, you've got to apply energy and to, uh, to push it uh, back up. In other words, the, and as the ball falls down, it reaches a new state of equilibrium. And um, it's quite, uh, quite interesting. If we look at the flower, the flower gets energy, as we've discussed in other places, from, from sunlight. And so there's uh, a flow of, of, of heat and thermal energy that uh, gets the uh, and ultraviolet, the energy from ultraviolet light. And um, it, the plant itself operates as a little heat engine and converts the heat energy in the sunlight um, into useful work. And um, just like if you have water flowing down a stream, flowing over a water wheel that uses gravity, um, you, if you want to harness the gravitational energy from that flowing water, you have to have a machine. And that machine is the water wheel and gears and everything that can use uh, to grind the flower. 
And so we need a machine. And of course, in plants, the plants themselves have a little uh, machine. Um, and this machine does the work. It, it actually creates molecules using that energy. So it manipulates chemical bonds. So it takes materials, water, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and some other nutrients, and using the energy provided by the sun, it puts them into specific arrangements. In other words, that energy is used to create the chemical bonds that produce the new compounds. And of course, those new compounds are programmed by the DNA in the in the plant itself. This uh, type of uh, which directs, it's a blueprint that directs and creates the molecular machinery using pre-created molecular machinery, the ribosome and so forth that we've talked about. You know, it's really amazing how these systems work. But initially, as we said, that everything is flowing to the state of lower temperature, to greater disorder. Even the Big Bang theorists talk about the Big Bang expanding and so forth. And so all this points to a beginning, to a creator. And I think the evidence is just there in our face that something, some amazing superintelligence had to set up this system that works so well. It had to set it up and start, and that's exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created light, energy. And from then on, we have the universe created, the earth created, the universe created, and so forth, space, and so forth there. It fits exactly that there is a creator. And when I think about, and there are so many examples of this, of that the, the great minds that made some of the greatest discoveries have been Christians, I personally believe that God, the Holy Spirit, has inspired a lot of those thoughts. In fact, I was um, uh, you know, w- watching some documentaries on some of the events that happened during the Second World War where particular soul, um, men, particularly in the Allies, made decisions that were against the, you know, the main command, but they, that led to a very important victory. And there were amazing coincidences that I think in many cases were supernatural, such as the cloud that came in during the evacuation of Dunkirk. And Herbert Butterfield, uh, who uh, was a historian, professor of history at the University of Oxford, wrote a book on this. Um, the the role of providence, God's providence, and uh, in people making decisions. And so I think the evidence is overwhelming for a creator God that has directed our minds and enabled us to discover the laws of physics. And that creator God, of course, is revealed in the Bible. You've been listening to Faith and Science. And remember, if you wish to re-listen to these programs, just Google 3ABN Australia or one word dot org dot au and click on the listen button. I'm Dr. John Ashton. Have a great day. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio. 